Glad to be a marshal, Robert. It's a wonderful day to be a marshal for the TA Century, boy. I'm here to help! Sure is. New York City Century. I am here to help. We got lots of riders here enjoying the TA Century. We got about 6,000 people out here. Good morning. You guys all happy to be here? Yeah. Yes, here we go. All right. Well, we're going to show you the TA Century this year from a volunteer's perspective. Let's go right now. Good morning. Hello. I'm directing the traffic so that it doesn't interfere with the riders. And Steve's telling the riders to make their left turn. How's the ride going? Having a good time here. Where I tell the police what to do now, they love it. Joanne's driving the traffic. Come on, get through, red lights, anything. Fighting the motorists. I gotta go up that street! Not today. Thank you for uh, signaling here, keeping traffic going. It's my job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to Bike TV. Hi, Bike TV. Once again, Transportation Alternatives has outdone itself. <laughs> Sterling performance by all the staff. Especially Mr. Dennis Eckersley, who I know on a personal level. <laughs> Sterling young man. All right, get out of here. All right, I'm out of here. Good morning, how are you? I love it. All right, say hi to Bike TV. Hello, Bike TV. Good morning, have a nice ride. <laughs> are you enjoying the ride and being a marshal in the TA Century? Have a yes, I am. Yes. It's wonderful. Are you, are you regretting getting up that early? Not. Regretting. That's just not liking. <laughs> it was just not fun. But I'm here. It's a wonderful, beautiful day, and I hope these riders have a have the kind of day they should have. And I know I busted a gut just trying to get the sand off the Plum Beach and do a lot of uh, trees out of your face, <laughs> pruning. Cobblestones. Cobblestones ahead. Bike TV. How's your how's it going and being a marshal behind the scenes? It's always fun being a marshal. It's more fun than riding. You get to help people, they tell you how much they like it. And on a beautiful day like this, it's the greatest thing in the world. I love New York. I love being a marshal. I love bike TV. <laughs> What's the best thing about being a marshal? Uh, working behind the scenes, helping people, maybe creating more bike riders. Somebody who might feel a little bit more comfortable bike riding in New York City. Look at this, 6,000 riders strong. Everybody having a good time on the century? Yeah. All right, that's good. Everybody give me a hoot and a holler. Wow. Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah, that's right, Bike TV live on the TA Century. How's the ride going? It's going very well. We haven't had to throw anybody off for bad behavior yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm, but then I haven't been hanging around with you. Watch the traffic, please. Look at this man. Look at him. He's in a sling and he's still a marshal. How you doing today? I'm doing great. My voice well, look, is a little tired. Look, I have some friends that want to say hi. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I made it. Yeah. Amazing. Good job. I'm going to fly away. <laughs> all right. Andrew! Hey, buddy. It's all going fine except of all these cars we got here. What are we going to do about the cars? <laughs> I got to get a shot of the marshal doing his wonderful duty, thank you. Welcome to Prospect Park. You've ridden 17 miles to get here. There's not only marshals on this ride, there's lots of good volunteers like here at Prospect Park. Captain by this man, Jeff Pratt, longtime TA volunteer. The people love him, see they throw oranges at him. But look at all these great people doing a great job. How's everything holding up here? Uh, really well, we got like 25 volunteers who are doing an incredible job. And we're pretty delirious, but having fun. And as you can see, he's been using that megaphone a few, too, a little bit too much today, right? I can't speak without it. And please, while you're at the tables, thank the people behind the tables who make all this happen. So how's it like life being a marshal? We're doing behind the scenes of the TA Century today. Well, I'll tell you, it's great. <laughs> Nothing short of wonderful. But everyone's eating up all the damn bagels, man. These are great oranges. You should eat these. Sun kiss, damn it, sun kiss. Beverages. We got our 
good for fruits and lots of protein, the peanut butter and the bananas. Lots of good stuff to keep us going today. On the TA Century, you get to see all kinds of cool New York City landmarks like the Brooklyn Bridge and here the Unisphere in Flushing Corona Park. Don't miss it next year. Look, there he is. He's a marshal in action. Are you guys happy that there's a marshal here? Who's gosh? Will it will it work? Will it fit? Yeah. Okay. Here we are at the Astoria Park rest stop with Ken Coglin, who's a big, big, big man here. He's been uh, been the manager of this rest stop for how many years? I lost count, I think it's seven. And he's, he's just an example of some of the great volunteers we got here on the, the uh, New York City Century. And we got Ross over here, and we've got Robert, two of our other favorites. You guys have a good ride? Great ride. Wonderful. Beautiful day. I think it was the most beautiful weather. I met a 74-year-old woman who was riding 75 miles. Wow. She, she was an inspiration. A mile in a, a year. Uh, well, That's next true. year. <laughs> she was keeping up with me. <laughs> well, as uh, we're a little bit tired, we're not going to go to the finish in Manhattan, but we just wanted to say thanks everybody for watching Bike TV. We'll be back next year and uh, hope to see you out on the roads riding your bike. Marshals love Bike TV! I'm Mary Seidman, and I'm a choreographer in New York City. I was invited to make a dance for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Sightlines Project, which is a project every year, and it involves uh, outdoor, site-specific dance projects. So I came up with the idea of doing something for the bike path on bicyclists. And this piece became a, a dance known as freewheeling. And I tried to audition a lot of different bicyclists in New York City, as well as dancers. And I ended up with a cast of 10 people, uh, five women and five men, as well as five dancers and five regular New York City pedestrian bikers who just enjoy the activity of bicycling on the bike path. So we ended up rehearsing for about six rehearsals and we came up with this dance called Freewheeling and I really believe it's a very whimsical, playful piece. We dressed them in suits because uh, I thought it could be a little parody on the Wall Street businessman since all of the dance takes place in Lower Manhattan near the Financial District. And uh, we've had a lot of really great feedback on the dance so far, and this is uh, its first run. Um, I have some people in other cities interested in bringing us to their city for an arts festival, those cities who have bike paths. So we're real curious to see whether or not that might happen in the future. And if anyone wants to find out more from us about this dance, you can check out my website, which is www.marysidemanandancers.org. And Sidman is spelled S-E-I-D-M-A-N.
I think part of the process by which Americans came to think about bikes sort of as something purely recreational or even a child's toy during the 20th century had to do with a lot of these forces that were completely reshaping the country. Once you got to the point where the car was a mass consumer item and the landform of the United States really changed around that feature. After the Depression and World War II, you, you had personal incomes rising very fast uh, and mass production techniques driving the costs of, of cars down so that it was getting more feasible for almost every household to have one or more. And as that was happening, there was, you know, there was a sort of centrifugal force and people were leaving the city and the, you know, the dominant mode of development was creation of car dependent communities outside of cities and on the fringes of metropolitan areas. The car enabled that uh, and the car then deepened that as those, those communities were built and those communities then required more and more cars as they grew. And the bike was just submerged in all that. The aspect of the American mindset that may sort of preclude bicycle transportation uh, really has to do with the way our cities are built. I mean the built environment really influences our mindset. It influences how we think about transportation and how we think about our lifestyles. The built environment, the way the streets are designed, the way the sidewalks are there, whether or not there's bicycle facilities and infrastructure, all of these send very strong messages to people about what's legitimate behavior and what's not. And so really the anti-bike American mindset, if you will, is um, resultant from years and years in cars first planning, which has resulted in cities and streets, which uh, again, just send the wrong message. They, they tell you that you're not an, a legitimate road user unless you're here in the middle of the road in this automobile. And I think that's the only reason that's begun to change now is because car dependence reached its own limits and it's reaching its own limits <clears throat> as we speak. For instance, in suburb to suburb commuting and the, the growth of jobs in the suburbs has absolutely gridlocked the suburbs these days. And it's very, it's, it's hellish, the commute uh, to get from bedroom community to suburban office park because everyone, 99% of people do it by car. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it's failing and breaking down. And you're seeing more people view cities as the place to be. So I think we're seeing the rebirth of central cities is, is, is allowing cycling to become more viable for more people. I think cycling is reclaiming a greater niche and, and people are understanding the need for more balance and more options in transportation. I think in some ways it's the fact that we're building bike facilities and people are using them shows that it's not absolutely cultural. Person by person, people can begin to chip away at anti-bike bias, and you're seeing it happen here in New York. Bicycling is booming here in New York. Just look at the East River Bridges, where trips have doubled um, just in the past five years. More people are using bicycles, not just in New York, but uh, in many other cities around the U.S. and the world, for a number of reasons, ranging from health to efficiency to uh, willingness to uh, decrease maybe our dependence on foreign oil people are beginning to realize and making their own statements really and that's a, one of the beautiful things about bicycling is that uh, it's its own statement. It's a living, breathing, pedaling statement that you stand for something um, or a number of things and that's why I'm a cyclist because uh, there is that melding of idealism and action um, just in the uh, mere act itself. So it's something everyone should do as individuals and by doing it yourself you're actually part of that change. I think my favorite thing about bicycling is, uh, you know, just getting out there every morning, getting, the, getting right into the world. You know, when you're bicycling, the world doesn't pass you by as fast as when you're riding in a car or a train. You're, you're really, you're slowing down, you're sort of really experiencing the community, experiencing nature a lot of times, uh, something that you don't very often get to see in New York City. But just riding down some really nice blocks, really getting to know your community, getting to learn your way around. And I think that's really my favorite part, is really just experiencing the community. The primary way of increasing any, any market, especially a bike commuter market, would be more people riding by bike. I think New York City has reached the critical mass of the number of bike commuters out there. I don't think you can stand on a street corner and not see a bike commuter. Everybody gets exposed to this as an idea and as a concept. People in every office probably know somebody who can use to work by bike. The idea is spreading. It's germinating and that it's a contagion. 
theory of, of how more people are going to ride. And it's done one to one. It's, it's showing people that it can be done and then doing it. When I first started bike commuting in 1969, I'd come across the Brooklyn Bridge. It would be me. And if I saw another bike rider, it was lucky. Now you can't even get over the Brooklyn Bridge with, with so many bike riders. We, we, they dedicated a, a bike lane on Manhattan Bridge just for us. And even there, it's getting pretty crowded sometimes. And Williamsburg Bridge and, and other places. The bike market's climbing, and the more it climbs, the, more, the bike commuter market's climbing, and the more it climbs, the more it's going to climb. You know, oftentimes when people find out about uh, the fact that I commute to work every day, the most memorable thing about it is, you know, their reaction. Their, you know, their eyes get big and they're uh, very, like, curious. They're like, oh my God, are you serious? Is that really what happened? And, and uh, you just talk to them, you, you explain, you know, it's just riding a bike for a half an hour a day and uh, it's actually pretty nice. And uh, people, uh, people tend to get a little bit more curious when they realize that it's not such a big, uh, daunting uh, task. Cycling is very low impact and you can get, get out of it what you put into it. I think you're seeing more interest in cycling from a fitness point of view, from a sport point of view, from the fact that more people are living back in central cities and bicycling actually works for them. The more people do it, the more they understand what's possible and what's viable and, and how it can work for them. You know, I think one of the things that can help more people have more interesting and more varied experiences on bikes and very appropriate and uh, perfectly suited for New York is the marriage of cycling and mass transit. And the good news is we actually, I think in the United States, we have the best system for that here. Here in New York, we basically have common sense rules about that stuff. There is a permit you have to use for some of the commuter railroads, like Long Island Railroad and Metro North, but the permit is cheap. You can buy it from any train conductor and it's good for life. So you can basically if you want if you, if, and you're able, you can ride 60 miles north along the Hudson, cross the Bear Mountain Bridge and take Metro North back to Grand Central. And it's a great thing and it, it's, it's one of the features of this region that's allowed me to continue to live in New York because I, I need some non-city experience at times. And the further you go north on the Hudson, the nicer it gets. So that enables you to do that without just riding 20 miles north and 20 miles back. New Jersey Transit got rid of their permit system. They're just pragmatic about it. They they'll tell you where to put the bike. They have fold-up seats. It's great. I think the path system is the same way. The subway system, it's just common sense. If, if you can't fit on the train, don't get on it. Uh, otherwise, everything is fair. Just don't rub your chain on somebody's pants or dress. The government can do many things to promote the bicycling as, trans, as transportation. One of the main things that they do now is, you know, starting a, about 10 or 12 years ago as a result of Senator Javis before he died, the Highway Trust Fund was broken open, so it wasn't only available for, for roads. A, a percentage of it is now available to bike and pedestrian facilities. As a matter of fact, the percentage is only available for bike and pedestrian facilities. Um, and so the government will often follow the money in New York City, we've been very lucky to have a, a good advocacy group that stayed on top of this. The bike lanes you see on several streets is a result of this funding. The ribbon racks that we attach our bikes to is a result of this, this funding. The New York City bike map that, that we seem to go through thousands of each year is a result of, of this funding. Uh, improvements in the bridges is, is often a result of this funding. The West Street bikeway is a result of this funding. So where the money is, the government's going to follow. We have to get out there and be and be and direct where that money goes. One of the big initiatives right now is called Safe Routes to School, um, which is a program, a pilot program, to encourage kids to ride to school. At this, at, you know, 50 years ago, it was very common for kids to ride their bikes to school. Now, it, it, you hardly ever see it. This is a program to try and get more people to ride, their, more kids to ride their bikes to school or to walk to school, uh, addressing some of the the obesity issues and and lack of exercise issues that a lot of the kids face. And working with, with local officials is, is the way to go with this. There's going to be one or two, maybe three programs in New York City for this because it's been very well received by several of our members of the House of Representatives who, who, who push for this initiative. And, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. A lot of bike stores, that, you know, like to service the commuters. They're regular. They work, you know, they're out there riding 240 days a year, which is a lot more than you can say about a lot of other people, and they do need a lot of help. We try to stay open at least until 8 o'clock to handle the commuters, the stragglers, etc. in New York City. Most of us are carrying very, you know, specific products that help the commuters, and the most common item there is the theft proof lock like the New York kryptonite chain. We also carry fenders, we carry racks, we carry bags that 
We even have we have a, uh, a one bag that you can put your suit in or your dress in, and it's a pan, it's like a connected pannier that's specifically made as as a suit carrier. Well, I think um, people who are already cyclists and people who are interested in in seeing cycling become a broader <clears throat> activity or something more widely embraced. People in the cycling community can really affect things themselves mainly by getting people they know who are interested in at least some level of activity and getting them out, getting those other individuals out on a bike occasionally to do that sort of eye-opening type of thing. Whether it's getting into an event like Bike New York or TA's uh, New York City Century, which takes place every September, you can just say the west side you can get from the George Washington Bridge to the tip of Manhattan these days without a whole lot of exposure to traffic and it can be a real eye-opener. Yeah, you know, you can go the length of Manhattan and back, and it might be a little work if you're not a habitual cyclist, but it's possible and it's doable and it's low impact and it's fun and, you know, you get outdoors for a while. Or, you know, take them over the George Washington Bridge or, you know, just take them over the Queensboro Bridge and, and you, know, look, you know, you can get to some interesting places that way. I also think in cities and metropolitan areas and maybe even at the state level, state government level in some places, there's a role for leadership in creating more space psychically and, and culturally for people to try that. Individually, um, we can only do so much. I mean, it's, it's obviously very important for people to be proud of, of being a bicyclist and to help their friends and colleagues and family also discover the joys of cycling. But really the only way that we're going to see a significant change in how people perceive the bicycle how our leaders perceive transportation is if we organize. I mean, we really have to get together, act as a group, and be smart ab about how political change really happens. And what we're doing now, what we're seeing now, not just with transportation alternatives, but with other groups here in New York and around the U.S. and the world, is that there, there are really key coalitions, uh, linkages with other groups being made, health groups, um, uh, sustainable and, and environmental groups that are much more focused on air quality and global warming. People who are concerned about cities, who just like the historical and sociable nature of cities. And we're seeing this coalescing of a whole wide variety of interests who are increasingly see the bicycle and other forms of sustainable transportation as really a, a key change to be made um, to solve a whole host of environmental, social and economic problems. So um, only through organizing are we going to see this, this major breakthrough. Today we're visiting the East Bay areas of Berkeley and Oakland. As you can see behind me, there's a lovely traffic circle. This is indicative of many of the wonderful bicycling amenities and traffic calming devices that the cities of Oakland and Berkeley use. We're gonna explore some of the unique features of what makes a bicycle boulevard right now. One of the more unique aspects of the bicycle boulevards here in the Oakland, Berkeley area are these gigantic stencils they imprint on the asphalt of the road. And it, you can see here, Bicycle Boulevard. It's a bicycle symbol, a large bicycle, almost the size of a car with boulevard, arrow pointing the way you're supposed to go. And these symbols are here to one, let cyclists know and comfort cyclists that they are indeed in an area where they should be safe. And number two, it's to let motorists know that they are now trespassing on an area that is set aside for bicyclists, primarily for their safety, and that they should be careful when they're riding on these streets. So how's this for first class bicycle treatment? On the bicycle boulevards, there are purple signs indicating the mileage it is to nearby and popular destinations. It's a wonderful amenity that you don't see in very many cities. It's nice to know how far you have to go to a destination on the bicycle boulevards. And the fact that it's purple, well that's an added bonus to Clarence Eckerson because that's his favorite color. Right now I'm actually standing on a traffic circle, which is one of the traffic calming devices used frequently in Berkeley to slow down traffic. They also use a lot of speed humps, a lot of traffic diversion measures. One really cool thing you'll find is at the end of some one-way streets, there are bollards placed so that through traffic cannot go through. However, an exception is made for emergency vehicles and bicyclists. 
and this is another way to keep through traffic from entering the neighborhoods and getting on the bicycle boulevard. Now another way to identify bicycle boulevards are by the street signs. The street signs are normally brown or white in the Oakland and Berkeley area. Here we have a bicycle boulevard that's marked in purple along with the purple color scheme of all the signs and the bike stencils on the street. Uh, this fully captures the bicycle boulevard experience as you're going along and these are things you look for when you want to travel along a bicycle boulevard. Hey folks look bicycling nirvana. The intersection of two bicycle boulevards, Bowditch and Channing, right here. And this happens many times in the bicycle network in Berkeley. It's a wonderful thing. So you can experience Nirvana over and over and over and over again. Speed humps, lots of them. They're everywhere. They're around schools. There's three on some blocks. There's a high slope making cars really slow down because they know if they hit these a little too fast, more than the recommended 15 mile an hour speed limit, well, they're gonna probably bottom out. And that's good news because that slows cars down and makes the street safer for everyone. He waved to us, how good is that? Is that awesome?